present, passive normal state decoupled with the boson extreme. For this, we really should use the BRSD formalism. We replace the 1 1 primary V by the corresponding BRST invariant we were including the ghosts. I call it curly V. It's V times C C tilde, where C and C tilde are holomorphic and mental holomorphic ghosts. V, <coughs> v is sometimes called the unintegrated form of the Varnax algorithm. To systematically understand string perturbation theory, it's always best to start with unintegrated Varnax algorithms. So, Curly V has ghost number 1, 1 and dimension 0, 0. <coughs> the same that ordinary V was an old vector becomes the same that curly V is BRC trivial. That's Q of some W. In the BRC approach to computing an S matrix element, we consider a world chain path integral with many of these BRC invariant algorithms curly V and so on. To make the path integral non zero, we need a lot of anti ghost insertions. This many, 6p minus 6 plus 2n, if we're in GSG. <coughs> and then the dependence of the world chain path integral on the anti ghost insertions gives a differential form of top degree on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with n mark points. Then the genus G contribution to the scattering integral is given by this formula, an integral of the differential form over the moduli space. Suppose now that, that one of the vertex operators is pure gauge, for example, let V1 be Q of some W, where the ghost number of W is 1 less than that of V1, because Q, the RST operator, increases the ghost number by 1. Then we consider a world chain path integral where V1 is replaced by W, and since the ghost number is 1 less than it was before, it takes one less anti ghost insertion to make this path integral on 0. So it defines a differential form. His degree is one less than it was before. That means its degree is too small by one to be able to integrate it over modulo space. Now, the essential fact in the proof of gauge variance is that the BRST operator Q maps to the exterior derivative in the sense that the form made by inserting Q of something is D of the form by inserting that something. In other words, here's a form whose degree is too low by 1. It's actually not closed. D of it will dx by q, the BRC operator, on these things here. But by hypothesis, the v's were all annihilated by q, but q of w was v1. So this formula is the link between the exterior derivative of the line space and the BRC operator. So this link is the essential fact of the proof of gauge variance for massive null vectors. The, a, a matrix element where one of the v's is q of something is given by an integral of the modulus space of the corresponding differential form. But that differential form is actually d of something by this formula down here. And so the integral of d of something over modulus space is the integral that something over the boundary of the multiple space. So, assuming the boundary contributions are zero, we've proved gauge invariance for massive null vectors. In the last step, we integrated by parts and used Stokes' theorem. To complete the proof, we have to show that the boundary contributions vanish for the problem we're considering at the moment, which is decoupling of pure gauge in the S matrix. There's no difficulty. So the moral of the story is that decoupling of longitudinal nodes is always proved by integration by parts. But in general, we have to make the integration by parts not on the string world sheet sigma, but on the moduli space of string world sheets. The case in which we can get away with integration by parts just on sigma is exceptional. The link between the two kinds of integration comes from the following. If you take the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of GNG with n punctures, you can forget one of the punctures. And that gives you a map to the mind of a space with one less puncture, the fiber being a copy of the surface. So if you want to, you can do an integral over MGN 
by first integrating over the fiber of this forgetful fibration. Now, for mass on small vectors, you can prove gauge invariance because what is supposed to be zero is already zero when you integrate over the fiber. But for massive small vectors, you don't learn anything interesting by integrating over the fiber. <coughs> Only the overall integral has a simple property, is the integral of an exact form. So the proof of massless, of gauge invariance for gravitons or other massless states of the bosonic string doesn't require the full machinery that you need to understand gauge invariance for massive states of the bosonic string. Now, just as in field theory, there's another difference between gauge invariance for massive and massless particles. Actually, this is kind of a fitting data to mention what I'm about to say, because it is going to be tied up with today's Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, gauge invariances of massive particles are spontaneously broken, that would lead to conservation loss. But gauge invariances of massless particles are unbroken and do lead to conservation loss. To explain how this happens, we consider in bosonic closed string theory what I've written is the gauge parameter for massless graviton theory. And if the, k is the momentum in space time, the dependence on the string center of mass is this exponential factor e to the i k dot x. So if k is non zero, v1 is the massless null factor. It's a longitudinal graviton which is supposed to decouple for gauge invariance of general relativity, and we just discussed the proof. <coughs> but if k is zero, so we drop this factor, then suddenly w only contains anti-holomorphic operators, c tilde and d tilde of x, are anti-holomorphic. <coughs> that is, they're functions of z tilde and not z. So if we said k is zero, W becomes anti-homomorphic, and Q of W, we can still call V1, but it's actually zero. So everything we said before is still true, but in addition, V1 is zero. So there's another reason for V1 to decouple the end at zero as an operator. So now, you see, the correlation function is zero more trivially because V1 is zero, but we can say everything we said before. Everything we said before is still true. So now zero is equal to something. So the left hand side is trivially zero of k is zero, but the right hand side is actually, of course, zero since it equals the left hand side, but it's not trivially zero. We get non zero integrals over the different components of the boundary. And the fact that these contributions add to zero is a conservation law, which in this example of massless graviton null states is going to be conservation of momentum, or momentum plus winding in a compact factor. So we'll return to this at the end. But for now, we'll just remember that there is this important special case. If the momentum is zero, there is another reason for the correlation function that it should more trivial reason. And that will teach us something new in the world. Well, what it teaches us is this is zero. But we'll study that more carefully later. But for bosonic strings, once again, we don't need this abstract approach. The conservation laws only come from massless numbers, <coughs> since gauge symmetries of massive states are spontaneously broken. And as I explained at the beginning, for massless null vectors, we don't need the full machinery. We have more elementary argument involving integration by parts on signal. So let's do that one for the conservation law. So instead of saying that Q of W is zero at zero momentum, what we say is that well, QW would usually be curly B, and the derivative of W would usually be B. Well, at zero momentum, they're both zero, so DW is zero. In other words, W is a conserved current, an anti-homomorphic one. We don't need fancy arguments on moduli space to get a conservation law. A conserved current on the world sheet gives us one directly. 
So as usual, we get a conservation model. We consider a correlation function with dW inserted. So it's zero because dW is zero. And then we integrate not quite over all the signals as written. We have certain other operators. We remove a little tiny disk around each one. And we integrate over the complement of all those disks. So it's zero because dW is zero. But on the other hand, by using Stokes' theorem, so if we didn't know, by using Stokes' theorem, we're integrating an exact form. So we can write it as a surface integral. And the surface integral is a sum of integrals over little circles around the operators. So if Vi has charge Qi, meaning that the surface integral for the i operator multiplies it by Qi times 2 pi i, then 0 is the sum of these surface terms. And that's the sum of these things. And therefore, for the correlation function uh, with of just the last n minus 1 operators to be down 0, there has to be a conservation model. The sum of the charges is 0. So I hope that was familiar to most of you. All I'm saying is that a conserved current leads to a conservation model in either classical or quantum mechanics. We just use conserved current of the world chain. So one notable thing about this is that it always works. If the conformal field theory we start with, a tree, string tree level, has a conserved current L U, then the argument I, work, I, I just gave works for any genus of sigma. So it gives a global symmetry to all orders of perturbation theory. A symmetry of a given conformal field theory is a symmetry of the corresponding. Symmetry means conserved current. A conserved current in a conformal field theory gives a conserved current in the corresponding string perturbation theory to all orders. It doesn't have to work non perturbatively but it works to all finite orders in perturbation theory. There's no way for a Goldstone boson to come in and spoil the word identity. Okay. So this is going to be my review of the boson string. It's not everything, but it's what we need for today. So maybe I'll take a moment to stop and answer questions on this. Now we go to superstring theory. So in superstring theory, we've got bosons from the reverse word center and fermions from the one center. Maybe my talk should have come in for the next one on the history of string theory. <laughs> for gauge invariances of mass and states from the reverse word center, there's no essential difference. But gauge invariances of mass and states from the remote center are different. What for today's lecture, the essential difference between string, superstring theory and the Fosan string theory is in this sentence. The coupling of gravity and all modes and the associated global symmetry, which is space time supersymmetry, must be studied by the decoupling for massive null states of the bosonic string, not the massless ones. So for the bosonic string, there's a simpler formalism for massless null states, but in superstring theory, you need to use the full machinery even for the mass of small states when they come from the Roman center. The simplification under the Roman string occurs for mass of small states doesn't arise for gravitinas. The reason for this is that the place on a superstring world sheet sigma in which a Roman vertex operator is inserted is built into the geometry. The usual people, the traditional way to say this is that the odd part of theta as a square root branch point at the location of a Roman vertex operator. That's a good description locally. Globally, there are some advantages in an alternative description in which you say, you don't talk about square roots, but you say that the superconformal structure degenerates in a certain fashion along a certain divisor. But we don't really need that today. All we need to know is in this sentence, there's no notion of moving a Roman vertex operator while otherwise keeping the surface fixed. That doesn't mean we can't prove decoupling of gravity in our null states, but it does mean that the proper formalism to do so is the same as the proper formalism in the bosonic string theory, 
for decoupling of mass signals things. So I'm going to make two statements in parallel. We'll have two paragraphs in parallel. So the blue one is about the boson extreme here. Uh, this is a summary of what I said before. A vertex operator can be moved from the world sheet without changing signal. In the case of a massive null state, that, that's a true fact, but it doesn't help. We need a more powerful formalism of integration by parts on the moduli space, not on the world sheet. So I now make the parallel statements for superstring theory. So the parallel statements, the last sentence, I think I will again have three sentences, but we'll count the number. But the last sentence will be the same, but the first couple sentences are different. So, so this sentence is different from this one. A Ramon vertex operator in superstring theory cannot be moved around on this superstring world sheet without changing signal. So, so we can't prove gauge invariance by integration by parts on signal. Well, that kind of matches the second sentence, although the reason it was different because the first sentence was different. But the third sentence is the same, except for the funnels. Ah, unfortunately, even the funnels are the same by the second micro. We need a more full power of formalism of integration by parts on the super modular space, not on signal. This was meant to be a different font from the modular space versus the super modular space. I tried to fix the fonts this morning, but I messed up on that one. So, for those who find this helpful, the fancy way to say it is that, see, in boson string theory and similarly from the Hirsch Schwartz vertex algorithms and super string theory, there is a forgetful vibration where you forget one the position of the vertex algorithm. But there's no analog of this forgetful map for model punctures on the super remote surface. So there's no notion of integration integrating over the fiber. So the only way to try to prove gauge invariance is a full integration over all the modular space. So we can't take a shortcut to prove gauge invariance for one states. We need to apply the full BRC machinery. Now, I told you already about 10 minutes ago how to what is the full BRC machinery for mass and wall states of the boson extreme? We'll just say it again very fast, because it's the same thing perfectly for superstring theory. Well, everything is the same except you have to understand what a few of the concepts mean. So, um, the statements are formally the same, but we're now on a super manifold, the modulized space of super remote surfaces, rather than uh, an ordinary manifold. So, to, although the formal statements are the same, to know what they mean, we need to understand integration by forms, integration of forms, exterior derivative of the Zorxis theorem or supermanifolds. So, the second half of my talk will actually be explaining that. And just to make contact with uh, another series of lectures that we heard the first one has been, um, we really need all this modern supermanifold or a stack. Because the, the so-called moduli space of super remote surfaces is really a stack, and the stacking structure is much more important than it is for the moduli space of ordinary remote surfaces. It's more important because you can't get rid of it by taking the finite time. So I'll explain at the last part of this talk what these concepts mean on a super manifold, but for now let's just assume that we know about Stokes' theorem and supermanifolds, and then we'll uh, make the formal statements. I'll just repeat what I said before, and now we could be talking about either mass equation variances of boson string theory, or the decoupling of a graphic and null factor, or for that matter, a massive or massless, in the first words, null factor or supertree theory. The, the general BRST machinery works uniformly in all cases, so I will just restate it. The only thing that's really exceptional about graphic and null vectors is that we can go to zero momentum and space time and define a global symmetry, space time super symmetry. So just recalling what we said before, if we have a bunch of BRC and variant vertex operators, then the world sheet interval defines a top form of one in space that we integrate to get a scattering amplitude. If one of the Vs is Q exact, then the world sheet path interval would be one replaced by W is a co-direction one form. And the relation between these forms is that 
the one that, because the scattering amplitude is D of the one with the gauge parameter. So the proof of decoupling of a null vector is, as we said before, a correlation function in which V1 is a null vector is an integral over a supermodular space of the corresponding form. But that's D of something. And so by stoicism there, it's a value as well. So I copied this from a previous slide, except that I changed the symbol I used for the modified space of ordinary neuron surfaces to this corresponding formula for super neuron surfaces. Although I'm kind of cutting corners with my notation because I'm not distinguishing the long and the virtual functions in the notation. Just to keep the just to avoid distracting the things in the formulas. As before, to complete the proof, we just have to show that the boundary contributions vanish. For decoupling of pure gauge modes from the S matrix, this poses no real problem. Now, for the bosonic string, we, used, we needed this formalism for massive gauge invariances, but they are related to conservation laws, because as in the case of the work of today's Nobel laureates, there are no conservation laws associated to massive particles. So conservation laws only came from massless particles which didn't need these, this formalism. So in bosonic string theory, the proof of conservation laws was straightforward. What's different about superstring theory is that since we need this formalism for some of the massless gauge fields, the gravitinos, there are conservation laws, space-time supersymmetry, that really require this formalism. So let's discuss the conservation law. Here I've written, according to Friedman et al., the gate generator for a gravity, gravity and null state. So just as in the bosonic scheme, well, the key point is that if k is 0, so in general, q of w is a null vector that's supposed to be coupled. But if k is 0, then q of w is actually 0. So in that special case, the correlation function is zero for trivial reason. Plus, we can also use Stokes' theorem. So giving, using Stokes' theorem gives a formula. And the formula says that something integrates to zero over the boundary of supermodular space. And that formula is going to be our conservation law. The supersymmetric board entity comes by explicitly evaluating the right-hand side as a sum over the components of the boundary of modular space. We'll discuss that later. Oh, well, a little bit more. So the boundary is the union of components that represent different ways that the surface can degenerate. That's an example, schematically, that's an example of a boundary component of supermodular space. So we get a word identity, but zero is the sum of all the boundary divisors of a certain correlation function. And that's the identity that under favorable conditions leads to space-time supersymmetry. So, um, I think I'll now explain the condition under which you get space-time supersymmetry and how they can fail. First of all, most of the Ds don't contribute. A necessary condition is that the momentum flowing through the singularity has to be generically on the shell. If not, well, the traditional way to say this is that if that momentum isn't clear of the on shell, you can define the boundary integral by analytic continuation from a region where it vanishes because the momentum is space like. So there only are a few of these many boundary components. There only are a few that can contribute. So here's one. On the left, there's the supercurrent S. And one more vertex operator, all the other guys are on the right. So the left part of the world sheet contains the supercurrent and just one other vertex operator. Now, when you do the path integral, if you're living on this side, whatever is on the left looks to you like a local operator passing through the middle. In other words, you only care about what's on the left through some effective operator insertion that it produces here. So, to, to evaluate the contribution of this component, 
you simply replace the left part of the world shape that contains two operators by an effective operator that corresponds to the right hand side of the picture. This operator is linear in S alpha and in V, so we can call it in Q alpha anti commuter to V, where this formula defines a linear transformation of the space of the string states. And that linear transformation is called the space time supersymmetry generator Q alpha. So that's the definition of the space time supersymmetry generators. Whatever can effectively replace this thing, if you're living over here, is linear in V and in S. So I call it Q alpha of V. It's linear in V. And the linear transformation Q alpha is linear in S alpha. In other words, it transforms like a spinner of the Lorentz group. So this gives us a definition of the space time supersymmetry generator Q alpha. And if contributions of this kind are the only ones with the sum of which of the many Bernanke operators appear here, then we get a worded entity that zero is a sum of terms in each of which Q alpha acts on one of the vertex operators. So that's the standard form of a worded entity for space time supersymmetry. And you would say that the usual way to describe this formula would be to say that the S matrix is invariant under space time supersymmetry. That formula would represent space time supersymmetry of the S matrix. But space time supersymmetry only holds if these are the only contributions. There's another conceivable type of contribution where S and nothing else is on the left hand side. In field theory terms, this contribution involves a matrix element where the supercurrent creates a Goldstone fermion that then couples to the remaining vertex operators. So there's a real life example where this happens. So if that happens, you don't get space-time supersymmetry. You say that space-time supersymmetry has been spontaneously broken. In higher orders, what will then happen is that the gravitino will become massive and the vacuum will become unstable. But the first thing that will happen is that in a certain order in perturbation theory, space-time supersymmetry will break down. The order where it will happen will just be the lowest order where the picture on the left is non-zero, where there's a matrix on it rise up with a critical the magnet, a mass experiment, the gold center. So we have a framework in which we can prove space-time supersymmetry and also understand how can we spontaneously broken in the perturbation theory even when it's valid at tree level. The framework is the same <coughs> one by which one proves gauge invariance for massive states of the boson screen. The framework carries over perfectly well to superstring theory once you generalize concepts like integration of form and stosis theorem to superbound such as the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. The fact that in general the working entity does have a Goldstone boson contribution reflects the fact that it's not really correct to think of the fermion vertex operator as a conserved current on the string world chain. The reason it's not really correct is that the Fairbairn vertex operator is a Ramon sector operator, and it doesn't make sense, as I said before, to move a Ramon vertex operator while otherwise not changing the surface. So you can use the Fairbairn vertex operator to create something on the moduli space of super Ramon surfaces but you can't really use it to create something on a fixed supermodal surface. So I then sometimes ask the following question. Is the fact that space-time supersymmetry does not come from a conserved current on the string wall shape, is that an artifact of the RNS, Ron over Schwartz, approach to superstring perturbation theory? I've already told you one reason I think the answer is no. There's a physical effect that can happen because space-time supersymmetry is not a conserved current on the world chain. As a result, it can be spontaneously broken in loops, although even when it's unbroken at the tree level, there can be a Goldstone Fermion contribution through the world chain. So the fact that this contribution can be non-zero in examples shows that there's a physical effect. Say that the answer to this question is no. 
It's fine, however, to look at another approach to superstring perturbation theory, although I believe that very, very interesting, although less systematically understood, is the pure spinner approach of Berkowitz. In the pure spinner approach of Berkowitz, the same thing happens, but technically for a different reason. You can write down an action which has manifest space time supersymmetry, but the path integral with that action isn't well defined. To make it a conversion path integral, you need regulators. The regulator is Q of something, but the something does not have space time supersymmetry. So, as a result, in the path integral, it actually makes sense. The space time superparameter is not conserved, it's conserved up to Q of something. And that leads to the same structure as described in the context of the arguments model. So the rest of the talk is actually going to be explaining what the exterior derivative of the Dux theorem mean for supermanifolds. So that means that those of you who may have tuned this out because of unfamiliarity with string theory uh, do have a second chance. You can understand the rest of the talk. The only trouble is it might not be interesting. I can't make any promises there. But a lack of knowledge of string theory won't keep you from following the rest of the talk. Any questions on what I've said so far? Okay. So I saw you can, should just. Yes? Yes. You want supersymmetry, space asset symmetry to be preserved or not? Well, I want to know what happens to the actual model. So, I have a criterion. Sorry, perhaps I should have used this time Space time supersymmetry is preserved if and only if this makes its own S alpha to create a Wilson for amount of vanishes. So, in models, you can. Typically, that's true. And when it's true, you can usually prove it without any trouble. For example, in 10 dimensional superstring theory, it's true trivially because the mass of spin and half fragments have the long chirality to be created from the vacuum by the superparts. Super for example, if you had our experiment, there's a massless neutral spinning at fair amount, but it has the opposite chirality from the supersymmetry generator. So, to prove space time supersymmetry from the head of our you need to know that a certain matrix on the zero, but it's actually trivial to zero. Once you know that, you have the proof of space time supersymmetry with all orders. With minor modifications, the same argument works for all the 10 dimensional spin units. And actually, almost all. Uh, Superstructure compactifications also happen the same way. Sorry. The main counterexample is no, is this one. So. So there are models. This gives us a framework to decide when space-time supersymmetry is true in perturbation theory. When it's not true in perturbation theory, the model will become unstable in high orders. If, if you want to show, if you want to construct a model where you have a systematic perturbation expansion, including quantum gravity unified with other particles and forces, then you want space-time supersymmetry to work. So, um, in most of the standard models it works, and typically there's a trivial proof that this matrix element is zero. <clears throat> what we've gained compared to previous formula formulations is that we have a precise criterion for what would go wrong, what could go wrong, and how to prove it doesn't go wrong. Any other questions? That was actually a good question. I've been immersed in this stuff so much for so long, but I forgot to tell you that this criteria is actually useful in practice. Um, no other questions? I want to understand why in the bosonic case you put the master state instead of this generic or the fact that the, the, there is no the semen is potentially broken. So what, what's the difference with what, why it is not? Well, broken? first of all, in bosonic string theory, what actually goes wrong with bosonic string theory is not that symmetries become spontaneous broken, but that there are inferred singularities associated to the dilaton. Crudely speaking, the tacking, but the really serious problems with the dilaton. Now, uh, it's kind of a separate discussion from the one I planned today but it's also possibly more familiar. In superstring theory, well, for example, in the 10-dimensional superstring theories, if you know that supersymmetry is valid in loops, it implies that there can't be a tadpole for the dual time, and therefore that you can't run into inferred similarities. 
So having this criterion is the essential point for explaining, for example, for the heterogeneous and ten questions, that perturbation theory goes to all of this. Any other questions? But I don't want to take the time to have 
the, the, the screen goes right about. So the function f of x and x should be written here. And the integral is not over m, while the void has a fancy, fancy name pi of t m. So anyway, the superminimal with both blows on the permanence. Now what does integration by parts mean? Well, we define an operator d, which is the sum of dxi times partial with respect to xi. It acts on functions of x at dx. Integration by parts says that for any g of x and dx, the integral of dg over m is the integral of g over the boundary of that. I wish I had form this formula and this one better, but we'll live with what we've got. Now we're going to, uh, I will not resume that it's reasonably familiar and go on to the case of a fermionic variable psi instead of a bosonic variable x. So first of all, there's no particular subtlety in defining differential forms. We just add another variable d psi of opposite to 6 to psi. So d psi is bosonic. Where things change is when we consider functions of psi and d psi. In the case of the bosonic variable x, dx was fermionic, so a function f of x dx holds automatically polynomial in dx, in fact, linear, in the case of a single variable. But now, since d psi is bosonic, we have to decide what class of functions of d psi we want to allow. For example, we might want to decide we want to allow constant functions of d psi leading to functions of psi and d psi that really only depend on psi. If we do this, then since we all also want to have an exterior derivative, we run into the following fact. Acting on a function of only psi, d will produce a function that's linear in d psi. And then if we want to be able to act with d on a function that's linear in d psi, we'll get a function quadratic in d psi. So basically, if we want a reasonable class of functions, that includes functions only of psi, on which the exterior derivative acts, then we have to allow functions with the polynomial dependence on d psi. This is a good class of functions because if f of psi d psi is polynomial d psi to degree n, then df is polynomial to degree n plus 1, since when we act with d, we just get one more power of d psi. So this makes perfect sense. And functions of psi and d psi that are polynomial and d psi are called differential forms. They're useful. The only problem is we can't, for example, why they're useful is that in string theory is that vertex operators, never Schwartz vertex operators, can be differential forms. The only thing which is wrong is that we can't integrate a differential form on a supermanifold. That's because there's no top form. D psi to k is non-zero for all k. So we never get to the top. And because D psi is a bosonic variable, we can't integrate a polynomial. The integral over D psi of any power of D psi never makes sense. Well, if we can't integrate a differential form, what can we integrate? Well, we can certainly integrate a delta function. We can integrate delta of D psi over D psi. This suggests that if psi is a fermionic variable, we might want to allow this kind of function, a function of psi times delta or d psi. However, if we're going to be able to formulate a version of Stokes' theorem, we need to have an exterior derivative. And if there's going to be a version of Stokes' theorem saying that the integral of f is 0, if f is dg, we need to have a class of functions in which it's conceivable that a of psi times delta of d psi is d psi times something. Well, what kind of something has the property that if you multiply it by d psi, you get delta of d psi? Well, uh, the answer to that question is delta prime of d psi. Delta prime of d psi, if you multiply it by d psi, of your sign gives delta of d psi. So, if you want a of psi times a delta function to be d, which means d psi times d by d psi i times g, then g should be what I could. b of psi times delta prime of d psi. And then it's true that f is dg. Oh, sorry, it's not true. 
Then it will be true that f is dg if it's also true that a is d by d psi of b of psi. But since psi is an odd variable, that tells us that a of psi is independent of psi. In other words, for a single odd variable, b of psi was linear in psi, so its derivative was constant. So the condition that a times delta of d psi is exact will tell us that a is independent of psi. But then by the standard rules of fair integration, Stokes' theorem will be true. In other words, the integral over psi and d psi of a of psi times delta of d psi will be zero because a is independent of psi. And the Bears integral says that the integral d psi of something independent of psi is zero. Well, once we allow the wave functions a of psi times delta of d psi and b of psi times delta prime of d psi, the same sort of logic tells us we should allow distributions, <coughs> arbitrary uh, distributions in d psi that are supported by d psi and other distributions. We should allow arbitrary derivatives of the log function. <coughs> Thus, we have two classes of function f of psi and d psi. Differential forms have a polynomial dependence on d psi. And integral forms or diff distributions supported at d psi equals zero. Differential forms are important because they include functions, and integral forms are important because they can be integrated. It makes sense to multiply two differential fo forms by each other. It's called the wedge product of differential forms. And it makes sense to multiply an integral form by a differential form. But you can't multiply two integral forms by each other. Obviously, we have to interpret the measure that comes from the superstring path integral as an integral form. But for example, the vertex operator of graviton is a differential form. If we explain the relation between differential and integral forms a little better, we get to the concept of picture changing that was introduced in perturbative string theory by Friedrich Martin and Pichempi in 1985. We consider any supermanifold Q. Actually, Q isn't the best name, because earlier it was the VIST number. We consider any supermanifold Q with bosonic and Fermat coordinates. I'll treat the coordinates uniformly and just call them QI. QI could be either bosonic or Fermat. To introduce differential or integral forms, we introduce a Clifford or Y module with additional variables EI and FI that are respectively tangent and cotangent to Q. We say that for each i, e i and f i have statistics opposite to, opposite to q i, not opposite to i, opposite to q i, and they have a combination and anti combination relations. That e with f is a primary number, and e with e or f with f is zero. So I use this funny symbol with the square bracket on one side and the curly brace on the other. That's a combinator if they are bosonic and an anti combinator if they're feminine. We also define the exterior operator as the sum of EI, EI, and QI. Clearly, the exterior derivative makes sense as an operator acting in any representation of the combination of the anti combination relations. Let's discuss some representations. If Q is bosonic, then E and F are fermionic. Then we have canonical anti combination relations, and they have a unique irreducible representation up to isomorphism. For example, for a single even variable Q and a single odd pair even F, if we postulate a state that's annihilated by F, well, first of all, F squared is zero. I should be the same. So for a single odd variable F, this relation will tell us that F squared is zero. So given any state, either that state is annihilated by zero or F times that state is annihilated. Any state, if it isn't annihilated by F, then by X minus F, we get a state annihilated by F. So every representation has a state annihilated by f. But just as the f squared is zero, likewise e squared is zero. So the state gotten by acting with e is annihilated by e. <coughs> so, um, well, it doesn't matter if we start with the state annihilated by f or state annihilated by e. We get the same representation either way. There's only one irreducible representation of isomorphism of the Clifford algebra of finite many generators. It's customary to represent E as DQ and write the states down and up as one and DQ respectively. 
The exterior derivative of that representation is dq times d by dq, as is familiar for bosons. If instead q is fermionic than ENF for bosonic, the canonical commutators tells us that e with f is 1. There's no content in the first relations. That's the basic difference between bosons and fermions. When e was fermionic or f was fermionic, the square was 0. But if e is bosonic, we just learned it's commutator with itself is 0, but it's trivial for a boson. And likewise for f. Now, it's not true that there's essentially only one representation of the canonical commutators. We can represent these relations <coughs> with the state of knowledge by f and the further states that are powers of E acting on that one. Well, there's no upper bound in K, and we'll never get to a state annihilated by E. Or we can start with the state annihilated by E, then we can act as often as we want with F, but we never get to a state that would be annihilated by F. So the two representations of the canonical commutators <coughs> correspond to differential integral forms. One way to represent, describe the two representations is to represent E as a multiplication operator and F as minus D by E. Then the two representations differ by what class of functions B are allowed. The state annihilated by F is independent of B, so in this representation it's 1. Mm -hmm. And then the states obtained by acting repeatedly with E are just E to the K, so the representation involves polarable functions of E. Usually P is written by DQ as DQ or D psi if we give Q a name that is more evocative than the fermion. So our states are functions with polarable dependence on D psi. These are called differential forms. If we want to be able to integrate and make use of Stokes' theorem, we need the other representation in which there is a state annihilated by E. If E is a multiplication operator, the state annihilated by E is the distribution delta E. The state obtained by repeated action of, of F, which is minus E by E on delta B, or the distributions delta K of E. Writing again E equals D psi, we see that our states are functions of psi and D psi, which in their dependence on D psi has distributional support at D psi equals zero. These are the integral forms. Of course, especially if there are many uh, fermionic variables, we can discuss mixtures. But these two cases are particularly important. In either of the two cases, the degree of a form is measured by the quantity f, which is e e by e, which has the basic property that the exterior derivative increases f by 1. For a single odd variable psi, the differential form e, e to the k has degree k. So the degrees of differential forms are 0, 1, 2, and so on, bounded below and above. The integral forms, the k derivative of a delta function, have degrees minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so on, bounded above and above below. And in string progression theory, we should interpret the world sheet path integral with all operators inserted being vertex operators for physical states as producing an integral form of top degree. When you're proving the decoupling of a null vector, you consider a correlation function where one operator has a ghost number or degree one less, and then the path integral produces an integral form whose degree is one less than. And it's in the context of these integral forms that the BRST operator maps to the exterior derivative and that you prove decoupling of null vectors in exactly the way that one does for the boson stream, as I explained in the first part of my talk. Thank you.
to define a differential form, we had a pair of bosonic variables, E and F. We could quantize them in two different ways. In one case, the possible values of ghost number go from zero up, and the other case they go from minus one down. Oh, yeah, so it's that's the What did you say? It's based on the ghost number. Well, we'll do. <laughs> in the bosonic string, we have a map from the Bears Chapel Q to the exterior derivative where ghost number goes to the degree of the form. We do the same thing. Everything in the bosonic string has an analog and superstring degree, provided you interpret the terms the way I've explained it. It's certainly a more to explain all that. And if you really want, want to understand it, I've written a paper with the same title as the talk of more on superstring perturbation theory that gives an overview of what I've done in the last two years. But if you wanted to understand the details, you really have to look at the longer paper, whatever it's called, superstring perturbation theory revisited or something like that. What I explained in the last part of the talk, where I told you about integral forms, I had notes on super manifolds and integration. And for those of you who are really our fans on this subject, you might want to read some of the stuff I've written on super Any other questions? We are multiple instruments, just as you know, in any other way. Okay. Any <laughs> questions? Can you calculate anything? Well, lots has been calculated. So, people, uh, the, the founder, you'll hear something in the next talk on the history of string theory. The founders of super string theory did all kinds of calculations in genus zero in the 70s and then Green, Schwartz, and Green, Schwartz, and Green extended it to genus one in the early 80s. And then in the 90s and around the early 2000s, explicit calculations were done by Gerber and Fahn in genus two. As the genus goes up, the explicit calculations become more complicated. So I claim uh, if you want an algorithm that works to all words, well, I've only told you today some pieces. I've written much more on the papers. There's a question you might ask, which is, uh, is there something that's simple enough that you can calculate, but subtle enough so that if you didn't know the kind of machinery I'm telling you today, you wouldn't be able to calculate it correctly? The best answer I can give to that is actually the paper that has the same title as the talk, more on superstring perturbation theory. It's in section three of the paper. And it has to do with the detailed correction to Dover and Fon, which they've actually verified subsequently in another detail. Yeah? Does this say anything about dark matter? No, this doesn't say anything about dark matter. This says that you can reconcile, or you can generalize the framework of standard quantum so that it's in, so that as you hear more in the next talk, including gravity becomes inevitable rather than impossible. And the perturbation expansion works all over us. Other questions? If there are no more questions, let's take this video.